That's a tough act to follow. Today's scripture comes from Psalms. Psalms 118, verses 24 to 29. And uh, I just want to say one thing, that my Bible, at the end of every chapter, it tells me to fight all my battles. Fight all your battles on your knees. All of them. Fight them on your knees. Psalms 118, 24 to 29. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have passed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The second scripture is from Psalm. 119. Psalm 119, verse 1 through 8. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Lord, of, excuse me, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do know in iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, I will keep your status. Excuse me, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. And that's it. So saith the word of God. Thank you, Brother Fred. <clears throat> so as I was thinking about this lesson, I thought maybe today... Uh, we need a reminder of just who God is. You know, a lot of times I preach, I preach on how we should be living, what we should be doing, how God wants us to live, all these kinds of things. But sometimes we need a reminder. Why, do, why bother? Why, why even, I don't know, if, I think this is on, yeah. Um, uh, why worry about how we're to live? So, I got to studying about the Lord, and I know Doug is going to love this sermon um, because it has something in it that I, I many years ago uh, I preached on, and um, and I've preached on it since, and it's like the Lord brought it around that I needed to preach on it again. Um, so as I got into the Psalms, and we read about the Lord, and we read about his steadfast love. I'll tell you, if you ever want to get uplifted, you get into the Psalms and read them, it tells you who God is. His steadfast love endures forever. If you belong to him, there's nothing that you can do that he doesn't love you. We all have little quirks. We all have things. Does that, is that true? We all have stuff. But God... In his steadfast love, he endures. Like, he endures that for us. He says that he loves us, and he means it. It endures forever. And so that is the kind of God that we serve. And when we pray to him, he hears us. 
And we must, we must learn to believe that, that as we pray, he hears us. And um, so I went into the Psalms, and I had Brother Fred read all that, Psalms 119, uh, 1 through 8, about blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept Diligently, I looked up the word precepts. It says the precepts are general rules or instructions that God gives to guide people's behavior and conduct. Um, they are truths that the for the that have the good of the individual in mind. So when God gives us precepts, when He gives us rules, He gives them for our good. Would you say we don't like rules? We don't like to be told what to do. Because uh, Brother Fred and I often laugh about that we are a stubborn, stiff-necked people, right, Fred? Um, we like to do what we want to do. But uh, these precepts that the Lord has given us are for our good and his glory. So um, as we follow them, as we look into them, um, I want to talk about some that he gave us. And I want to talk about who God is. So we go into Exodus. I'm going to go there because that's where, what, does anybody know what's in Exodus? Huh? What is it? The Ten Commandments. Good, Wayne. There you go. You got an A for the class. Um, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Um, and God spoke all of these words, the Ten Commandments. He said, the first, ten com the first commandment was, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So I want you to remember that word, I am. I am. Because God is who he says he is, and he is the great I am. He is the God that rules the universe. And he is the God that opens doors, shuts doors, uh, leads the way, shines the light, convicts us, helps us, shows us how to live. And he does that by his precepts, by his commandments, by what he has put in his word. He has given us a way to live triumphantly in a world that seems to be going down the tubes. But I'm going to say this. In Ecclesiastes 9, it says, there's nothing new under the sun, guys. This kind of stuff has been going on since the beginning of time. Sin has happened since Adam and Eve and the fall in the garden. Sin has been here. So what we're seeing right now, and I have said it myself, gosh, I've never seen it this bad. I'm going to tell you it's been this bad before. And God has moved. So we have to remember that God will move. He moves and when he does, remember we uh, I preached on suddenly, suddenly he will move. But we must persevere, we must push through, we must understand that we must stick to what he is, told, he is telling us to do. So he says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you, he's telling the Israelites, out, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So he gave them these precepts, these things to help them, to uh, lead them, to keep them on the straight and narrow. And so the first one is, you shall have no other gods before me. We shall have no other gods before the Lord God Almighty. And he's talking about, he's talking about a lot of images, the carvings and things that people did back then. But in the world we live in today, we have a lot of idols. I mean, I was listening to, there was a young girl I was talking to this past week. And she fought, they're called influencers. Has anybody heard that word? And people follow them like they're God. I mean, when they put a word influencer on them, they are not kidding. Because they are influencing the culture. Because people get on these sites and follow these people. It, it's amazing. And they're on their phones and they're listening to them and they're getting all this information. And they're, you know, and how do you know it's true? How do you know what they're telling you is right? And so influencer, and I just, I picked up on that word and I thought, wow, that's, that's really, that's an amazing word. Because, so the people that you see on the screen, 
become, you don't even know them. You don't even know who they are. And you're following them. Oh, look what they, how do you, oh, it just, it, oh, it grinds my gears. I get so irritated when I hear that because I think you are to be following the Lord God Almighty. He has given you your word, his word, to follow and to know. And you are to follow no other. Isn't it interesting that Satan came up with the word follower? We are followers on Facebook. We're a follower of that person. We're a follower of this, uh, even preachers. I'm a follower of that preacher. I'm telling you one thing. You better not be following me. You better be following the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. And you better pray that I follow you too. And no other. No other gods. No other opinion. No other uh, compromise. Follow the Lord. No other gods. No one. And in this day and age that we live, people become our gods. We look to them. Uh, the... the um, <clears throat> The uh, movie stars and the, the actors, and they, they think they're above because people have put them there. I mean, they, they make millions of dollars over people flocking to their movies. Now, believe me, I have a couple I like, but I don't follow them. I do not follow them. So, then number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to serve them or serve them. You shall not bow down or to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So the Lord <clears throat> is saying here, this is a dangerous ground because God is a jealous God. Did you ever think of God being jealous for you? Like wanting to be with you, wanting to spend time with you, wanting to be your God? I mean, he loves you that much. He is jealous for you. Like he... He desires to have a relationship with you, and he's jealous. You know, um, I have all these little grandchildren now, and Tekoa, you know how it's a lot of times she's attached to my hip. Well, when little Elsie came along, every time Elsie came my way, Tekoa threw a fit. She was jealous. She didn't want anybody else on my lap. Now she's gotten over it since then. Uh, but um, it's there's a jealousy because... She wanted to be on my lap. She wanted to be with me. And it, it's the Lord, it's a, that's a small way of putting it, but in a way, that's the way the Lord is with us. He doesn't want any God before him. He's jealous for you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to be distracted away from who he is. What happens when you get distracted? You usually fall down. Or stray. Or stray. You get, that's what usually happens when you get distracted by other gods, other things. What do you put above the Lord? We are not to worship anything like that. Number three, you shall not... <clears throat> Leroy said I should get up here and do that <clears throat> before I speak. He said, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord, now I want you to hear this. And I'm going to say, how many of you have taken the Lord's name in vain? For the Lord will not hold you guiltless who takes his name in vain. That is serious stuff there. His name is above all names. He is the great I am. And when you take his name in vain, you are messing with a holy, powerful, righteous God. Just the way it is. You can do what you want to. But he says, do not take my name in vain. I will not hold you guiltless. 
If you do not repent and you do not turn and you take his name and you use it, it's a bad thing. Remember the Sabbath. Oh, boy. Okay, everybody, get ready. Get your steel toe cheese on. To keep it holy, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Get it in on six days, guys. I mean, I'm talking to myself, too, because <clears throat> I thought of, I've thought i said this before. I thought about going home doing laundry um, <laughs> because I didn't have time this week. But it's going to wait till tomorrow. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it, what? Holy. Holy. God calls us to be holy as he is holy. He blessed the Sabbath day to rest. To rest. Does anybody need rest? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we all need to rest. When we get weary and we get worn out and we get tired, it's hard to sit through a church service without getting sleepy. It's hard to sit anywhere without getting sleepy. I'm going to tell you one thing. I can sit. And, and now if I was sitting back there in the back row and I was listening to a preacher, I know what I'd be doing. Oh, I'm fighting it. Because this morning I was tired. And I know a lot of the rest of you are too. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to say fight it, fight it, fight it off, because what the Lord wants to say to you is very important, and he's telling you, get your rest, get your rest, people. You are not super men or super women, even though sometimes I like to think I am. I am not. I need my rest. I need it. Years ago, when I had all my four little children running around, and I thought I could, I mean, I was just a mess. I just was emotional. I was, ooh, everything just set me off. Right wing. <laughs> and I remember my, he don't remember, is that what you said? No. I said it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> oh, but it's true. It's true. I had, it, I mean, and I was exhausted. And my Aunt May came in one day, and I was having one of the meltdowns that I was having. And she says, Karen, you need some rest. When you put them down for a nap, you lay down for a nap. All that other stuff will be there when you get up. I thought, I know. <laughs> That's a problem. But I had to train myself to lay down and rest when they were resting. I just, I had to do it. And it, it changed my life, really, just getting a little bit of rest, knowing that I just, you know what? It's not bad to lay down and take a nap. Amen. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Wayne says amen to that. Uh, the Lord says we need rest. So remember that. He did not create us, create us to just go, 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 go. That's why he gave us night, to lay down and rest. Take a break. Take a breather. And I know it's hard with children, right, Carissa? It is hard. And Ashley, I, I mean, all of you that have children, it's hard. But grab it where you can. <laughs> put a show on for the older ones. The others put down for a nap. I'm giving you some advice here. And lay down. Go to take a nap. Um, and just, you know, let, it, let, let yourselves get some rest. Allow yourselves that luxury of getting a little rest, even though I know it's hard. So sec, uh, number five. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother. What does that mean? That means honor them. Now, do you always have to get along with them? Do you always have to agree with them? Sometimes it's not easy. We all have parents. With a lot of us are parents. Um, our kids like to tell us what to do. Um, but... I will not stand for them not honoring us, at least being respectful to us. I mean, we may not have done it all right, 
but we did the best we could, just like they're doing with their own children. So for us, we are to honor them. We are to take care of them. We're to look after them. We're to love them. They might be hard to love, but that is what the Lord tells us to do. So we do it. We do it. And, and ask the Lord to give you a, a cheerful heart in that. You know what, Lord, I'm going to honor them. I may, maybe I don't think they deserve it. It doesn't matter. He says honor them. Take, look after them. Take care of them. Love them. And that's where, we, that's where the maturity starts to happen in your, in your Christian walk and life. You've got to rise above that kind of stuff. You've got to get over yourself. And you've got to realize that what you're doing is for the glory of the Lord. And to honor them is part of the giving glory to the Lord. Being different than the world because so many, and I'm not knocking people that have to put their, their parents in nursing homes but I've seen a lot of people, I, when we were cleaning houses, older people that lived alone, that their parents or their children never showed up to help them. They counted on the cleaning ladies to take their dog to the vet or go get them some groceries and things like that. That should never be. That should never be. We became like their children. They would call us for things. Do you mind doing this? Could you do this? It was pretty... That was pretty amazing. And it's more than you would think. And they all had children. So, anyway. Number six. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. So, we talk a lot about the abortion issue this, in this uh, nation right now. Thou shalt not murder. Right there it is. Don't matter what rights you think you have, you shall not murder. And we are a murderous nation. Shame on us. Shame on the church for not standing up against this murder that's happening to our children. And that's, I mean, that's short and sweet, isn't it? People say, well, I don't know what to say to him. I don't know what scriptures to use right there. You shall not murder. Because God is all about life. He is all about life. You shall not commit adultery. Uh, adultery is a terrible, a destructive thing. And we see many churches and organizations fall because of adultery. The preacher gets mixed up with the secretary. Or gets to running around with the music director. Or whatever. And the church, what happens to the church? It falls. There's someone in leadership that's fooling around with so-and-so and so-and-so. And you hear about it. And the church uh, implodes from within. And it's never the same. Adultery is a killer. It is a killer. The grass ain't always greener on the other side. So you shall not do that. And even to look... To look at someone in lust is committing adultery. It is in your mind. And if it is in your mind, it will eventually come out. Remember that. Watch what you see. Be careful how you look. And be careful of your thoughts. Because your thoughts will lead to actions. They will. It happens all the time. Number eight, you shall not steal. Don't steal. That seems like an easy one. But we are not to be cheating or stealing or anything that would um, uh, not bring glory to God. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbors. You shall not uh, bear false witness. <sighs> okay, so <clears throat> gossip. So we, we, you know, we talk about gossip. We shouldn't gossip. We shouldn't talk about other people. There's lots of things that go around uh, in the workplace, in the church. It's gossip. We are bearing false witness. We are talking about people that we don't even know if that's true either. But it comes on down the line. Remember that word, uh, the, uh, uh, it, it was a game called gossip, remember? And you'd sit in a circle and you'd start out with, my Uncle Henry has a red Ford truck. 
And by the time it came around, it was my Aunt Susie went and picked up a duck. I mean, that's how it, that's how it goes around. That's how it gets. I wonder if I can But it was, it's true. So we, sh we cannot bear false witness. Don't talk, just don't talk about anybody. If you want to talk about somebody, say something good. Say, you know what? I, that singing yesterday, Bernie and Carissa, was some of the best I've ever heard. I mean, and I'm, I'm really being serious. It, it, was, it was absolutely beautiful. And I enjoyed it so much. And I could have sat and listened to it for a long time. Build each other up. Build each other up instead of talking about somebody or wanting your own way with something. So then if you don't get your own way, then you talk about the person that you didn't get your own way with. Really? Aren't we better than that? I think we should be better than that. I think we should be. By now, we should be better than that. It ain't all about you and your way. It ain't all about me and my way. And Wayne is glad to hear that. But it is not. It is not about me and my way. And it's not about you and yours. It's about the Lord's way. So bearing false witness against your neighbor, against your brother and sister, is a way to kill the church, and Satan knows it. And the Lord said, I'm going to tell him that. Not that I should have to tell him that, but I'm going to tell him, don't do it. Don't talk about each other in a bad way. Don't. It'll kill the church. It really will. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So how many times do we ride by a place and say, oh, I wish I had that place. Oh, my, I wish I had that car. Daniel, I wish I had your truck. That's beautiful. I wish I had that outfit. I mean, those are things. And let's look at it a little deeper. So you have a sister or brother in Christ, and they have this gift. And you start to want what they have. You are coveting what they have, the gift that God's given them. That's a church killer, too. All of us have gifts. All of us have things that God's given us. And so... You don't want what somebody else has. You want what God has given you. Amen? Amen. You want what God has given you. Amen? Amen. 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 Wake up now. Come on. All right, I'm going to get to the good part here. <laughs> so, I want to go into John. Those are the commandments of the Lord. Those are the precepts of the Lord. Those are things that he tells us to help us to, for, in the, for the good of us and to bring him glory. The Ten Commandments. Basic commandments, things that if we live by them, um, we probably do very well. So, But we're going to go into John. Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Let's see. I'm going to go start at uh, chapter 6. I'm going to roll you through here. So, I'm sorry, it, it might be hard to keep up, but if you can, that's good. So, we're going to talk about the Lord. We're going to talk about who he is. Um, let's see. I have something else I wanted to share here. Hmm. Well, we'll go here to John. So, um... We talked about the Lord saying, I am. So I went, went into John 6.35, and it's Jesus said to his disciples. Um, well, I'm going to go up to 32. Jesus said to them, who were his disciples, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am. 
he is putting himself with the, the Lord. I am. I am who I am. I am the Lord. I am the bread of life. I am who I say I am. And that is why we follow the Ten Commandments, because he is the great I am. He is the king. He is the one we worship. Why do we do what we did yesterday? We did it for the great I am. We did it for the God of all gods. We had did it for him. So we go, then we go into John 8, 12. And it says, and Jesus spoke to them. He was always teaching his disciples, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He is the great I am. He is the light of the world. He is who we follow. Whatever's going on in your life, follow him. He is the light of the world. And we will not walk in darkness. We will have the light of life. We will have the light of life in us because he is the great I am. That is who we follow. That is who we serve. And then we go to 10, uh, 30, set, or 10, 7. It's amazing how many times it's in here. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Amen. He is the door. He says, I am the door. I am the way to come in. I am the only way. There's lots of false doctrines and gospels out there telling you that there's all kinds of ways to get to heaven. That is a lie. There is one way. And Jesus says, I am it. I am the door. You can believe what you want to believe, but I am the door. And one day we're going to see that he is the door. One day when he comes, we will say, there is the great I am. There he is. When Jesus comes, we're all going to know that he is the great I am. We're all going to know. And anyone who has had doubts, anyone that's turned away, anyone who's followed a false doctrine, anyone, they're all of us. The faithful and the lost will see him. There's not going to be reports of him over here. Report, well, there will be. But we do not follow that. We do not listen to that. There will be all kinds of stuff going on. Now they can do these holograms in the sky. I'm telling you, you will know when Jesus comes. You will not have to go anywhere to find him. You will see him. The world will see him. There will be no question when Jesus comes. No question. We're all going to know. You're not going to call me up and say, Karen, did Jesus come? Well, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't see him. Not yet. I guess if I didn't see him, he hadn't come. Unless I got left behind. We all will know when he comes. Amen to that. Amen. So we do not worry about all the stuff that we're hearing and seeing because our God, the great I am, is after you. And he will make sure that when he comes, the whole world will know that he is here. So then we go to John 10. 11 through 14, I think I already read that. Um, well, I'm going to, uh, okay, so where did I stop? The good shepherd, that they come and have it abundantly. And then I, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is the good shepherd. He is the one that was came to lay down his life for us. He who is high, a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, 
sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. So the, the pastors of the day, when these times come, and they will, where the church is really shaken and the real, if there's stuff that's going on, we will see who has been a true shepherd and we will see who has not been. Because if you're true, you're going to stay <coughs> with the people. You're going you're to look after them. You're going to help them. You're going to walk with them, whatever comes. But if you are a hired hand and you're just in it for the money, there's big money in preaching now. Big money. Big houses. Big, all kinds of big stuff when you get to be a big preacher. There's all kinds of money. But when the wolf comes... We'll see who stands. We'll see. 13, it says, He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and they know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. That's us. And they will listen to my voice. And I want you to hear this. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. We're not going to have denominations. We're not going to have this group over here or this group over here. The Lord will come for one flock. One flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So this morning as I walked out, I was waiting to, we were waiting to, I was waiting outside to leave. I like to walk outside and look around, see what's going on. Have you noticed that how the birds are flocking right now? Have you noticed that? In the fall, they start to flock together. And you see them, and they go, ooh, and they go, ooh. They all like them. Um, it's amazing to watch them. Um, I love to just watch them go across the sky. And if one lands in, one, in a tree, they all land in the same tree. It's really an amazing thing to watch. And the Lord reminded me. And he said, oh, I done upset Lainey. <laughs> she hit her head. Oh, did she? Oh. Um, and, I, and it's like the Lord said, this is how the body of Christ is going to learn to be together. Just, just move together. Where one lands, they all land. When one flies away, they all fly away. That's how we are to move in the body of Christ. That's how he wants it. One flock, one shepherd. And we're to follow him. Won't that be amazing for all of us to just move in one accord instead of this one over here saying, no, it should be done this way. No, 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 I want it done this way. How about that? Ah! How about if we all just, oh, okay, that's good. Yep, okay, yeah, whatever. Oh, my gosh. How wonderful. And I'll say you guys are really good at it. But I've been in churches where it has not been so. <laughs> and they never, they never move. They never, they never go anywhere. They stay in their own little, and there they are. And God wants us to learn to fly and follow him. That's what he wants. Then we go to John eleven twenty five. 25. Let's see. This is it, uh, um, when Lazarus had been dead. He'd been in the tomb for four days. And Mary and Martha had sent word for Jesus, but Jesus kind of, you know, took his time getting there. And Lazarus died before he got there. And so um, when Martha, in verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection 
and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's what he asked her. Do you believe this? Do you believe this, church? That he is the resurrection and the life? I'm telling you, for us that have lost loved ones, and all of us have, we better believe in the resurrection that Jesus Christ is the great I am, and he is the resurrection. And that Jesus has taken our loved ones to be with him. That is our hope. That is the glory of it all. That's the, that's the great thing about being a believer in Jesus Christ, that he is the resurrection and the life. He is. I read this at every funeral I preach. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the one that we follow. He is the one that gives us eternal life. He is the great I am. He is the one that was and is and is to come. That's who he is. In John 14, uh, 6, and that'll be the last one because the time is getting away. 14, 6. So everybody, get away, get away. Um, Jesus said, Uh, 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. So here this disciple was, he had walked with Jesus for, what, almost probably three years. And he said, well, I don't know, how, how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am in the way. Have I not walked with you all this time and you still don't realize that I am the way? I think that's what happens in the church. We forget Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. Now we get to decide, do we believe this or do we not? And then there was one in John 15. It says, I am the true vine. So I'm going to read this real quick, and then I'm going to finish. So if I go to Exodus 3, I really wanted to share this, 314. Um, I just want to share it. Because this is where the Lord calls himself. Okay, this is when Moses, uh, he was calling Moses to do what Moses needed to do. And Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So the Lord gave this personal name, I am, to himself. It's um, the phrase we get, uh, to the, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh. God was saying to Moses, I want to be known as the God who is present and active. The name Yahweh reflects the promise of God's constant presence with his people. That's why God calls himself the great I am. He is always present with us. He never leaves us. He is constant. He is a constant force in our life. He is the one that leads us, guides us, and directs us. He's the one that hovers over us and protects us. He's the one that leads the way. That is who our God is. He is the great I am. I am the one that sees. I am the one that knows everything about you. He is the one. And that his Lord, that his name will be known forever. And it is significant that when Jesus was born, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. The great I am had come to earth through his son, Jesus Christ. What an amazing, isn't that amazing story? 
that the great I am, the God of the universe, sent his son to come to earth for us, to show us a way, the way, the way, the truth, and the life. He shows us how to live, how to, how to um, uh, do all the things he taught us in Exodus and the Ten Commandments. He shows us all those things. You know, it's hard to live without the Holy Spirit. So the Father sent Jesus, then Jesus left. He sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit helps us. He is our helper. He is our standby. He is the one that convicts our hearts. He's the one that helps us to distinguish between lies and truth. And he is the one that heals us and delivers us and sets us free. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're going through today, church, God is still the great I am. He is still on the throne. He still has your good in mind. And he is jealous after you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to see who he is. Because he is a good, good father. Amen, church. Amen. Amen.